Hi, welcome to this third clip of this week's uh, lecture on the concept of culture in the history of anthropology. And in fact, yeah, in this clip, having seen the kind of core idea in the previous clip, we're going to delve a little bit into the history of the development of this idea in the development of particularly cultural anthropology in the United States. So I think I mentioned in an earlier clip that in uh, the UK, we tend to refer to anthropology as social anthropology. And that's reflected in the kind of Durkheimian roots of the way that anthropology developed in, in, in this country. Uh, in the United States, people tend to refer to roughly the same activity, although as we see, uh, that's the whole point of today's lecture, it is actually quite different in some ways in its approach, but nevertheless, the similar kinds of phenomena that we look at uh, as cultural anthropology, and that's a different historical trajectory uh, histo um, in terms of the roots of the concept of the uh, of the concept of culture itself, which is what we'll be looking at in this clip. So, as I've said already in the previous clip, what's really at stake here is two visions of anthropology. Anthropology as a science versus anthropology as an art, right? And I really wanted to start uh, my comments on this with a little bit of an indication of the deeper stakes uh, of this debate in the history of the development of European thinking, actually. And I want to take you back to the origins of the word anthropology in order to make this point, which are actually uh, way predate the development of anthropology as a professional discipline, which happened in the 19th century with, this, with these evolutionist approaches, the influence of Darwin and so on, as we talked about in the first lecture but goes all the way back to the Middle Ages uh, and particularly theological debates about the position of human beings in a providential universe created by God, right? So already in the 13th century, in the work of St. Thomas Aquinas, we have references to anthropology, but what Aquinas and others, philosophers and theologians of the time mean by that word is really a study of where human beings sit in relation to their divine creator. So to give you an example, the idea that human beings are made in the image of God, which is such a powerful and important idea in, for example, Christianity, is an anthropological idea in that sense. So it's an idea about where anthropos, the human, sits in relation to the divine. In this case, it's a claim about the similarity between humans uh, and their divine creator, the similarity of image. That's an anthropological idea. So that original kind of concern with the relationship between human beings and God is where I want to start with, because really what we have is a historical development in which, in some ways, as um, the, the famous um, um, German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche said, the God, God is dead, is a famous phrase that we associate with Nietzsche. God was killed in the 17th and 18th century in France, right? So divine theological explanations about the place of human beings in the universe were rejected in favor of the nascent science uh, that was happening at the time, and this enlightenment project of science as an avenue for improving the lot of human beings through reason and knowledge, right? And one of the corollaries of that development of knowledge is to move from a kind of providential view of humanity to a secular one. So rather than trying to explain human, human phenomena with reference to what our creator God wanted for us, right? So, you know, kind of classic creationist, for example, accounts of humanity and so on. Human phenomena now are to be understood in their own terms. We don't need to appeal to God uh, in, in for our explanations of who we are and what it is to be a human being, but we can explain these kinds of, we can address these kinds of questions in their own terms through the advance of scientific knowledge, right? So that's the Enlightenment project as far as pertaining to human phenomena is concerned. So there are two 
so that's the fundamental kind of move from, if you like, to the from the Middle Ages to the Enlightenment, right? Which is a very broad context in which to see the development of anthropology. But the point that I really want to make here is that there are two avenues that kind of split roughly in the 18th century. Uh, and they correspond to those two sides of the debate that I'm talking about, the kind of anthropology as science side and the anthropology as uh, art uh, side, right? So roughly in the 18th century, this kind of secularizing view of the human splits into two possibilities. One is a more radical one, and it's really the, at the heart of the kind of approach that we looked at last week when we were talking about the uh, development of sociology and, and the concept of society, right? And this is the idea that human phenomena in principle can be explained pretty much uh, in the same sense, in the same way, and in the same aspirations to uh, explanation uh, as a natural phenomena can, right? So this idea of causation, uh, the idea of um, um, uh, progress and happiness through reason and the identification of universal laws that underpin human behavior, just like, like they are underpin uh, the way that nature works. Uh, and that through advancing this kind of explanation, we'll ultimately be able to work out what make human beings tick, just like we are trying to work out what make uh, or other organisms tick, or um, you know natural phenomena, or the motion of bodies through space, and so on. It's the same kind of project. There's no qualitative distinction between them, right? The second, and I notice there's a problem in the slide because both of the options are named one. I meant to be I meant them to be one and two, so apologies for that. The second approach is slightly less radical in its kind of secularizing tendencies because it says fair enough, we don't have to appeal to God when we explain human phenomena, but nevertheless, there is a sense in which human phenomena are kind of qualitatively different from natural phenomena. And that is because Human beings, if you like, and this is my way of thinking about it, right? This is not what they would say, but my interpretation. Human beings are a little bit like God used to be like, right? Because human beings are different from other beings, from other natural, from other animals, for example, in as much as they have human intentions, values, they have a will. A spider doesn't have a will. They make spiders make amazing cobwebs and amazing kind of constructions, but they don't do it through having an intention formulated in their mind and realized through their actions, like I might do in, for example, you know, giving you this lecture now, right? I have to prepare it, I have an intention of what I want to convey, I have to operationalize that, and it's my will to do so, it expresses my um, um, my will as a human being uh, is expressed through the actions that I'm engaged in right now, right? And these are underpinned by certain values that I hold, right? The value of trying to be clear and explain things uh, in a way that you can understand and so on. All of these things are peculiarly human things. So therefore, the study of human beings has to be different in quality from the study of uh, other uh, aspects of the world in which uh, we live, right? And this idea has its roots in Germany, and particularly in uh, the German idea of Kultur, which was expounded by the German philosopher Herder, Herder, I guess he would be pronounced in German. I don't speak German, so I can't pronounce it possibly the way that it is yeah, pronounced by Germans. And his dispute with his teacher, Emmanuel Kant, who was very much uh, aligned with French ideas of a kind of cosmopolitan anthropology, uh, that human beings across the world were ultimately subject to universal principles. Herder was reacting against this uh, universality uh, of the study of the human that his teacher Kant was propounding, and uh, he was much more interested in the specific ways in which what he expressed as the human genius were uh, expressed in different cultural formation in, in, in different cultural formations, right? So for example, different languages provide different possibilities for thought for Herder. So looking at the specificities of cultural expression were avenues to appreciating the, the different ways in which the, the genius of humanity was able to express itself, right?
So both of these approaches, the kind of French uh, uh, universalizing approach uh, that focuses on civilization, reason, and progress and universality, and the more German origin approach that, spoke, that focuses on the specificities of Kultur and the cultivation of the human genius through, through different uh, cultural formations and particularly languages, both of these are secularist, they don't appeal to God, but one, as I say, the first one is more extreme than the second one, because in a sense, uh, the, the position of the human, according to the German tradition, the culturalist tradition, is a little bit analogous to the position of God. So it is God's, uh, sorry, it is human's um, ability to have freedom, to have a will to follow their designs, rather than simply being kind of mechanistic organisms to whom things just happen like they do to other animals, which is distinctive and which forms the basis of uh, cultural anthropology as it later develops. So how does cultural anthropology develop? Um, really, it develops through uh, the inheritance of uh, American anthropologists of that German heritage through the founding figure of American cultural anthropology, who is Franz Boas, who was himself German, and he was trained in a kind of Humboldtian uh, tradition in Germany, where uh, you know Humboldt was propounding the idea that human phenomena need to be studied in their historical specificity. And this is something that Boas was inculcated into uh, in his studies in Germany before going to the United States. He moves to the United States as an emigre and establishes there very quickly a school of uh, thought within um, the University of Columbia, of, sorry, Columbia University in New York, which becomes a kind of hotbed of cultural anthropology in its development uh, under the tutelage of, uh, of Franz Boas. Very much like his counterparts, Malinowski and Radcliffe Brown in Britain, he was also very much a critic of evolutionism. Uh, the big evolutionist figure that, that he did battle with in the United States was Morgan. Uh, and he just didn't see any sense in this project of trying to order cultures in a kind of evolutionary progression as the evolutionists were trying to do, because he, in his fieldwork with Native American groups in different parts of North America, was incredibly impressed by the enormous variability of human cultures, right? So to try and kind of fit all of this variation and all this complexity and nuance into some kind of um, ordered succession of supposedly cultural progress made no sense to him at all, right? Uh, and in fact, during his fieldwork among Native American groups, he found that any kind of hypothesis on which evolutionist mod models were based at the time about how human phenomena are underpinned by natural causal factors to do with race, so this concept, concept of race as a scientific category was very much uh, embedded in, in uh, evolutionist approaches of the 19th century and early 20th century, or indeed the environment, right? So somehow the ways that we uh, think and act uh, culturally and socially are determined by our racial characteristics or environmental factors. This was central to uh, evolutionist models at the time. I mentioned that fundamentally evolutionism was a racist, white supremacist way of thinking about human societies and cultures. Franz Boas did battle with this and he tried to reverse the arrow, if you like, of determinism. So rather than race or environment uh, determining uh, the variation of cultural phenomena, it was rather the variation of cultures which determined the ways in which people in particular times and particular places thought of their environment, thought of themselves as, a, as, a, um, uh, as a humans, as a species, as their racial characteristics or their ethnic characteristics and so on, were all uh, cultural expressions. The very concept of race was a cultural development. Um, according to, to um, Franz Boas, rather than the, than the other way around, right? So rather than being racially 
uh, or racistly determinist. He's culturally determinist. Culture determines rather than, uh, uh, rather than nature, if you like, right? Indeed, talking about this question of racism, you'll maybe remember um, from the first week the, the reading by Jobson, who actually takes uh, to task the Boasian tradition of American cultural anthropology from the vantage point of uh, the politics of today and actually uh, takes to task Boas and his students for being uh, li merely liberal in their uh, anti-racism and uh, argues for a much stronger, more militant forms of anti-racism for today uh, and really takes to task the complacency of a lot of this liberal anti-racism that goes all the way back to Franz Boas. So that was the critical take that we saw in week one, just to acquaint you with the fundamental idea. There's a funny picture of Boas here and making it onto the front of the cover of the of Time magazine. So uh, he devoted a great deal of energy into kind of doing battle with uh, racist um, uh, scientific or you know, putatively you know, quasi-scientific positions at the time. Uh, so um, he fundamentally rejected the idea that was being propounded uh, at the time by a number of scholars that races, these things called races, had different potentials for cultural development, um, fundamentally racist uh, kind of theories that were prevalent at the time, uh, by arguing that cultures are sui generis and unique and innate differences. So any kind of, not only racial, but any other kind of uh, appeal to natural biological characteristics to explain cultural diversity uh, have no credit whatsoever as far as Franz Boas and his students are concerned, right? So these innate differences cannot simply account for the inordinate sophistication of cultural diversities, right? Culture rather than nature explains the differences between humans, right? So there are no natural, we're all part of the same species, we're all human beings. Um, our kind of ethnic characteristics do not explain the differences between us. It's cultures that explain differences between us. So if you like, for Franz Boas, culture uh, becomes a liberal, kind of American liberal political alternative to race. And he, uh, he engages in a great deal of polemic at the time in order to defend the idea of culture as the right way to think about differences between human beings and to argue against a race uh, as a uh, legitimate way to talk about differences between people. I just wanted to uh, acquaint you with uh, just uh, three very uh, significant and influential um, students of Franz Boas. Um, the very interesting figure, Zora Neale Hurston, um, who was his student, uh, African-American female student of Franz Boas, who devoted, uh, wrote a great number of books charting out African-American uh, cultural manifestations. Um, She's a very interesting and actually controversial figure, in many ways very conservative. She was a, an apologist for Republican politics in the United States, which is interesting in the context of uh, uh, the support and the position uh, in the kind of politics of, for example, Republicanism today in the United States and Trumpism and so on. So Hurston uh, is an interesting and controversial figure in many ways politically. But what I want to focus on here is just the way in which Boasian principles of culture uh, and, and the emphasis on cultural differences and specificities feeds through to her, into her work. So I've put a, one of the, her classic essays uh, on the readings in, uh, in your reading list, uh, where she argues that creativity and poetics, as we'd call it today, is the distinguishing feature of African-American or Black American culture, right? So she makes an argument about what makes distinctive African-American culture, right? And she was pitting this against contemporary African-American intellectuals in the United States who were very much highlighting the similarities between Black and white uh, Americans, right? Hurston was affirming cultural difference and saying there's something specific 
about African-American culture. And in some ways, she's kind of mirroring another very famous debate between Melvin Herskovitz and the African-American sociologist Franklin Frazier, uh, also in the kind of early part of the 20th century, where the sociologist Frazier was uh, emphasizing what he called African-American accommodations to mainstream uh, American white culture, while Herskovitz, uh, who was himself uh, white, was interested in um, the relationship between African-American uh, cultural manifestations in the United States and cultural manifestations and social formations in different parts of Africa. So he was drawing a connection between Africa and African-American culture, whereas Frazier, as an African-American himself, was emphasizing accommodations to, to uh, United States uh, um, um, culture and society. Perhaps the most famous uh, student of Franz Boas's is Margaret Mead. You see here on the slide, I've put a, um, a stamp <laughs> that had her face on it. That's how famous she was. Uh, she was a real kind of public intellectual. Uh, I've actually put a clip up uh, uh, on, from YouTube of her speaking uh, that you should watch for this week. I think you'll find it very interesting. Um, she uh, wrote a great, great deal. I'm just going to use one, perhaps her most famous argument as an illustration of a culturalist approach in anthropology. Very, very young, she gets sent effectively by Franz Boas in this very paternalistic way to conduct fieldwork in Polynesia and particularly in the island of Samoa. Uh, and uh, really to prove the culturalist thesis of cultural determinism and cultural relativity, um, Margaret Mead um, uh, is sent by Boas there to uh, examine the way in which teenagers um, uh, were different in Samoa from the way that teenagers behaved in the United States. And, you know, there's all these stereotypes about teenage behavior. Some of you may have been subject to those stereotypes quite recently in your lives. For me, it was quite a long time ago that I was a teenager. Uh, this idea that they're stroppy, that they go through a kind of uh, phase of rebellion against their parents and so on, that it's a very difficult time uh, to go through. All of these uh, putatively natural uh, ideas about, you know, teenagers and how their psychology and their physiology changes at that time are to be relativized by the American cultural anthropologists under Franz Boas by showing how in other societies things are done differently. So Margaret Mead goes out to Samoa to study teenagers and their cultural behaviors to show how different they are. And she comes back and writes this very famous and extremely well-read book, Coming of Age in Samoa, where she depicts this image of Samoan teenagers being completely free in their style of socialization, no kind of sense of strict authoritarian rules that, they, that they're subject to, and therefore no need to rebel against those rules. Samoan girls are happy, much happier than their equivalent in America, says Margaret Mead. They have a joyous, casual relationship with sex. They have a much more extended family that they can turn to. So um, adolescence is not nearly as difficult for them as it is uh, for American uh, teenagers. So the conclusion that they draw is that this is that puberty is not a universal biological process, but rather a cultural and variable process that depends on cultural context rather than biological uh, determination, right? I think it's worth noting here that Margaret Mead's uh, argument came under incredibly aggressive attack by an Australian anthropologist called Derek Freeman, who basically sought to expose the insufficiency and uh, problems with the manner in which she conducted her fieldwork. He effectively accused her of um, um, using her fieldwork and distorting it in order to prove the Boasian point that she was had already set out to prove she had already made up her mind of, on how to interpret this material before she even arrived in Samoa. He says that the Samoan people took uh, the mickey out of her and didn't tell give her the right kinds of data uh, and it all became incredibly aggressive and cantankerous, this 
uh, kind of um, attack of uh, of Friedman on 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 Mead and created a huge controversy about the value of ethnographic research, um, the way that we collect our data, how our data relates to our hypotheses in anthropology, whether you can reproduce and check uh, the data of another researcher within anthropology in the way that you're supposed to be able to do in the natural sciences. All those kinds of questions came to the fore in this kind of Friedman uh, Mead controversy. Finally, sorry, this is the, uh, 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 some images of Margaret Mead uh, and uh, um, the link to the YouTube uh, clip that I'm suggesting that you watch. And finally, um, I just wanted to mention Ruth Benedict uh, and her enormously important and influential book, Patterns of Culture. I won't go into the details. You can look at the slides which are up on Moodle. Uh, my friend, colleague and ex-student Tobia Farnetti, uh, who worked in Japan, has added some slides to the PowerPoint, uh, homing in on um, Ruth Benedict's famous book, The Chrysanthemum and the Sword, which talks about uh, uh, Japanese uh, culture very much in the way that uh, Boasian anthropology refracted by Ruth Benedict uh, would. Uh, the most famous idea that Ruth Benedict is associated with in that book, Patterns of Culture, as well as the Chrysanthemum and the Sword, is the idea that cultures can be interpreted uh, as personalities writ large. So each culture has its own personality and in turn acculturates its members into uh, emphasizing those aspects of their personality that fit the personality of the culture. This is the so-called culture and personality school which comes out of this culturalist approach uh, in uh, Boasian anthropology in the United States, which uh, Patterns of Culture by Ruth Benedict is a very good example of. So I leave it there with uh, this kind of very quick uh, history of the concept of culture in anthropology. Uh, and I'll see you in the next clip where we'll talk about uh, some critiques of these approaches. But I really just wanted to also encourage you to watch the clip of Margaret Mead speaking because I think it's really great to get it from the horse's mouth, so to speak. See you in the next clip.